We're going hands-on at Cinegear 2020 with the Alexa 35. This is a Cinedy Gear News video, supported by B&H and CVP. All right, so here's the Arri Alexa 35 body itself. Obviously, you have the viewfinder right here. You have various customizable button options. If you've ever used a Mini or a Mini LF, this is going to feel familiar to you. But I would say compared to the Mini, it's about, uh, I don't know, non-scientific 20%, 30% larger. I love this little side menu here that's on the operator side of the camera. Thank you for control freaks like myself. And I mean, it's just, you know, it feels like with all Airy products, it feels like it's built like a tank, like this, you know, I wouldn't want to drop this on the ground, but <laughs> it can take a hit. So media is going in the side here, uh, power button right above the media card slots. And then I'm going to just pan the camera around. You could see some of the uh, power distribution options here on the side. So Aerie told me there's actually two different versions of this module right here. You can pick between them uh, and you have a few options here, 24 volt max. They're all various, uh, let's see, three pin limo, uh, locking limo, then you have some two pin limo down there at the bottom. Um, let's see, you have SDI one, sync in, SDI 2, time code, all kind of buried behind this side cage right here. Uh, and then you have even a few other input options here as well as some more customizable buttons that go all the way up to 9 on the side. So, oh, and then of course you have the Airy LPL mount in there right now. Very easy to uh, adapt to other things like, of course, PL. So there you have it. There's a quick tour of the body of the Airy Alexa 35. So the new Alexa 35 has this deceptively simple side menu that's actually on the operator side of the camera, which I love. Single button press gets you into various menu settings. So a double button press gets you into different frame rate options. 23.9H, you got fixed 24 frames per second up to 120. Obviously, you have all the shutter angles you know and love, ISO. You can switch ND on the side here, all the way from 0 0.6 to 1.8. Uh, obviously, you have your white balance settings. And then at the top, you just you toggle between various menus here. So you can see we're recording 4K 16 by 9. So you can see we don't have any media in the camera. Uh, power, you can, you can see in both volts and then just time left on your battery. So for such an incredible camera in terms of the image that you're getting out of it, it's great that you have a menu that, you know, I just, I just saw this camera five minutes ago and I'm going through the menu and it all makes sense to me. Uh, and again, it's on the operator side, which is great. So there you have it. There's the side menu of the Alexa 35. All right, this is the menu for the Airy Alexa 35. I mean, if you've used an Alexa in the past, this is going to seem familiar to you. But we'll run through a few settings here. NDs built in 0 0.6 to 1.8. Uh, obviously, various frame rates in 4K 16 by 9 is what we're currently in in the camera. Obviously, you've got your time code on top, various shutter options right here, and of course, uh, you just hit set in the bottom right. Let's go back to 180. Um, and then ISO, 160 up to 6400. Uh, and then of course, white balance right here. It's not a cluttered system, which I love. I mean, you can see we're recording every RAW. The look is, is default. Uh, you know, I doubt this is final firmware, so it'll be interesting to see if anything changes before launch. But, and of course, 4K 16 by nine right on the top. It's just not a cluttered menu, and obviously it pops right out from the viewfinder, which is a design that I've loved for years and years and years on other Airy cameras. So uh, there you have it. That's a tour of the Airy Alexa 35 uh, viewfinder menu. Hey everybody, Graham Ehler Sheldon here from CineD.com. We're at CineGear 2022 to go hands-on with the Airy Alexa 35 with Chase. How's it going, Chase? 
it's going good. Well, I, I think we saved some of the best for last. Of course, this is the new Alexa 35. It's, it's an all-new sensor, right? Mm -hmm. What are just some of the high-level specs? We've talked at CineD.com a little bit before about some of the specs, but just at a high level, what, uh, what are some of the banner headlines? Absolutely. So it's kind of a, a two-parter, if you will. It's a brand new camera, brand new body, brand new architecture, new accessories, but also a brand new sensor. So it's kind of literally all new from the ground up. So it's a new 4.6K sensor. It's Super 35. In the Super 35 area, it's 4K. You can go up to 120 frames per second in uncompressed Airy Raw in 4K, 75 frames per second in Airy Raw in 4.6K open gate. Uh, one of the characteristics of the sensor specifically is the dynamic range. So you have 17 stops of dynamic range compared to 14 and a half stops of dynamic range with our existing camera. So it's an improvement of about two and a half stops. And that would be one and a half stops in the highlights, one full stop in the shadows. So an amazing dynamic range, the widest dynamic range of any digital cinema camera out there. We already had class leading dynamic range with our existing camera. So it's exciting to be able to have that now, even more dynamic range when it comes to shooting in any condition. So another big characteristic of the camera is the enhanced sensitivity mode that we added. So for customers that want to shoot in low light, they want to push the camera, we're allowing them to go up to 6400 for the first time. So exposure index 6400. And when you go above 2560 or higher, you have this option of using the ES mode or the enhanced sensitivity mode. And so you don't have to, but if you would like to use it, what it will do is it actually takes the black frames in between the exposures and uses that as a kind of map of all the noise. And it uses it to reduce the amount of noise in the visible frames where the shutter is actually exposed. So that's fantastic. It actually helps you reduce the noise at those higher EI values. Now, there's only two limitations with that. There's no motion artifacts or any issues you have to worry about technically for the most part, but the one things, two things that you do want to look at are that if you're going to shoot above 60 frames per second, you can't use the ES mode. And if you're going to shoot beyond a 180 degree shutter, let's say a 360 degree shutter, you won't be able to use ES mode. You're limited to 180 degree shutter, but it will allow customers to have really clean low light performance at those higher exposure index values. Next characteristic of the sensor and has to do with the camera as well is the text textures feature. So textures is what we're really excited about. It's like having a digital film lab in the camera. So with textures, you have nine different textures that launch. One of them is, of course, the default texture. So every Airy camera's always had a default texture. And a texture is kind of defined by the amount of grain or noise in the image, the amount of coarse details, so uh, you got like, you know, very macro kind of contrast, and then your fine detail, so micro contrast, for example. So those three characteristics kind of define a texture for us at Airy, and this happens in the sensor as the transform is going through the camera. So it actually is baked into the Airy Raw and the ProRes, and so textures offer different varieties of how the image should look when it comes to the amount of noise or grain, the amount of micro contrast, and the amount of macro contrast. Well, Chase, why do I want to mess with textures in camera though. This seems like something that would normally be a post thing for me. Yeah, so the, we, the reason we did it was solely based on the uh, f feedback from customers. So DP said that I lose control of my images and I want to have it a specific way and I decide that I want it this way and I don't want someone in post adding grain or changing the contrast or micro contrast or sharpness or softness of my image. I want to have it there as if it was a film stock, right? When you went and did fil shooting on film, you picked a film stock that was right for that project, didn't you? And you said, this is how I want it to look. I don't want somebody else after the fact to change the way that I intended it to look as a cinematographer. So we got all this feedback from many, many cinematographers on the world that said, I want to have something more baked into the image. And so this, again, doesn't have anything to do with color or LUTs or the look. It does have something to do with the overall representation of the image because, again, when you're looking at grain or noise, micro contrast and macro contrast, that really does affect the image. So having a total of nine, the default plus the eight more stylized ones, I think really gives the creator to power back to the cinematographers. Wow, I mean, you're kind of weighing in in a kind of a political debate, keeping autonomy over the image for the DP versus yes. the post guys changing everything, including reframing in post. Yeah. And if you've worked as a DP or cinematographer any amount of time, you've experienced this. Right. So uh, I love that. So Chase, let's talk about the body itself. So, sure. I mean, big mini fan, big mini LF fan here, of course. It feels maybe, I don't know, 20% larger, would you say, than the mini? Um, yeah, I think just slightly under 20% larger volume than the mini, uh, for sure. And then the mini LF, it's probably less. So the 
Mini LF and this comparison wise, the weight of the Mini LF was 5.7 pounds. This is 6.4 pounds, but it has way more horsepower than the Mini LF. It has more horsepower than the full size LF in a body that's just 6.4 pounds. So 120 frames uncompressed airy raw. You've got two completely independent 12G SDI outputs. So you can do 4K 60 out of each one with their own frame line, status info, peaking, false color. One could be HDR, one could be SDR. So we're bringing all the features of something like the full size Alexa SXT or LF into a small body and you still get all the benefits of having that small body. And we've added user improvements like, for example, the left side display, more user buttons. We're using the same Codex Compact drives as the Mini LF, but we also have a new two terabyte size. That two terabyte size is not only larger in capacity by double, but it's twice as fast. That allows for the 120 frames uncompressed area raw recording to the two terabyte drive specifically. But of course you can record in ProRes, you go down to 422HQ, all the way up to 444XQ. So it's really kind of based on what your shooting conditions are, which is fantastic and a lot of ergonomic improvements in terms of adding L bus onto the camera body, adding a serial port onto the camera body. So if you remember with the Mini and the Mini LF, you had to have an L cube to add your distance measure into the L bus stream. Now we have serial built into the body like we did on the full size Alexa. So we're adding the best of both worlds. So this kind of replaces our full size Alexa line and Alexa Mini line and merges the best of both together for Alexa 35. But it also doesn't feel like you've completely changed all of your ideas. I mean, yeah. about you still have a viewfinder, it flips out, you got this like uh, power, powder blue, would you call it, yeah. airy, uh, airy same knob. Oh, yeah. same viewfinder, perfect. Like the Mini LF, except for the fact that one advantage, it's actually in software compared to the Mini LF, is that we can actually drive the eyepiece for HDR 500 nits. So the hardware in the viewfinder on the Mini LF is the same, but with the Mini LF, we didn't have enough you know, horsepower. We couldn't drive that specific viewfinder in HDR. And so now with this, we can actually drive HDR in the viewfinder at 500 nits, so that's fantastic so that you are be able to see HDR on set at 500 nits. And then this, of course, can be driven in SDR because it's still the same flip-out SDR display. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, maybe, let's see, let's see if we can pan this around, maybe sure. take a look uh, at the opposite side. You mentioned 12G SDI, so I, I'm only bringing this up because there's strange debates on the internet about 12G SDI being a, a scary thing in terms of power input. I don't know if you want to weigh into that oh, yes, necessarily, but is it is it protected in any way? So these actually, for the first time, are protected, but we're still recommending that order of operation. The reason is, is because DTAPs, which are terrible, terrible connectors, and hopefully one day we'll never see a DTAP again on set, they're ungrounded connectors, right? So they're plastic shields and there's no grounding on them. So what happens is with certain SDI devices, when you plug them in via DTAP and power them, they look through for a ground through the SDI connector, which is not a good place to be looking Sketchy. for ground. <laughs> and then and it's over because you can't protect, by the way, 12G or 6G SDI like you can 1.5 or 3G. You can put what's called basically an electrostatic resistor that helps you know, protect over amplification when you're trying to look for a ground. But the good thing is here we've actually able to protect these connectors better than previous cameras, even though they're 12G. So that should hopefully fix the issue to a point. But I still recommend following our safety procedures, which is, of course, to power up the camera, plug in the monitor, power up the monitor, then they're both powered up and then connect the SDI connector. Because even when the connectors aren't running in 12G mode, they're still 12G connectors, so they're not protected on the other side. Now this again, for this camera, they're more protected than ever before. So we're trying to address that as best we can. We actually have custom hardware in here to try to do that and hopefully prevent it. But in a, You don't want to say it's 100% protected. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the good thing is, of course, we have two pin and three pin, so those are grounded connectors that are protected. So if you, uh, you can, do what we do here and power the monitor off via the two pin connector or a three pin. Now, if you don't know what Chase and I are talking about right now, the, you know, Ari, you guys put out a, like a white paper on the yeah. sort of operations. A lot of there's been a lot of discussion online, so just check out 12G SDI order of operations uh, with DTAP and power, and you'll get there through Google. Yeah, yeah, and it happens with 6G, like I said. So you know, anyone that had a 6G or 12G camera could experience it. If you had a camera that only did 3G or 1.5G, you're like, oh, what's this? This is new. So it's across every manufacturer. It's, it's not. Yeah, yeah, it's not exclusive to you guys, and but I like the fact that you've thought about yeah, protecting the camera if something yeah, happens. Um, Okay, so power distribution module. Is this something yeah. I can swap out for other things? Yes, or? Yeah, so this is one of the two modules we have at the camera launch. So the camera actually ends right here and you could go from battery right to the camera, but we have this as part of the production set because this is the production set of accessories. You've got the articulated plate, the top handle, the viewfinder bracket. So production set comes with power distribution module one. So this back here actually has four three pin 24 volt Fisher connectors and two 12 pin uh, two 12 volt two pin Limo connectors as well. So it's a total of six power connectors just on the power module itself. 
in addition to the power connectors on the body, which is one three pin Fisher 24 volt RS and one two pin Limo 12 volt. Which just makes the, the build so much cleaner and, and reduces the dependency on the D-tap that we were yeah, just talking about. There is actually also a D-tap on this. It's a D-tap down at the bottom, It's so you, you can't really see it, but it's a single D-tap that's the reversible Bebop style, so you can, you know, kind of put the cable out which direction you want. So there is still one D-tap on the PDM specifically. Okay, and the... The B-mount? Yeah, yeah, so I, I understand this is your new sort of battery system, I mean new-ish, maybe well, a year it's in. our open standard that we gave out for everyone to adopt. It's not proprietary in any way whatsoever. So when we were designing this camera, we knew that to get all the features we wanted in a small body and do it well, we needed to go to 24 volts for power consumption, especially nowadays when there's so many accessories as well that are drawing more power. So we kind of made that step for the industry to move to 24 volts, and we announced it years ago, telling everyone that the B-mount is the standard that we really favor, because it's an open standard and it's a side loading standard it's very rugged reliable and it supports 24 volts and even 12 volts as well so the battery manufacturers have been kind of playing catch up and getting ready and we are seeing now that every single major battery manufacturer is making b-mount batteries including anton bauer actually this is a prototype 3d printed of their b-mount batteries they'll be making of course they have their own solution as well but everyone from bebop core swit IDX, Blue Shape, everyone basically that you know of a battery wise core, they're all going to be shipping batteries. Um, probably most of them by the launch of the camera, the first camera shipment in July when we start to ship it. And if not by July, the end of the year. Some of them are just taking a little bit longer, but you'll have options from Core, Swit, Bebop, uh, all at the camera launch. Perfect, Chase. Now, um, besides sort of battery standards that you guys are helping redefine, yeah. you're also lens mount uh, standards that you're helping oh, redefine yeah, yeah. here. So we should talk about the lens mount. I mean, much yeah. has been said about the LPL. Not too yeah. hard to adapt to PL, of course. It really comes with the adapter, actually. In, in the production lightweight set, we include the same PL to LPL adapter we've included with the Mini LF and with the full-size LXLF, which has been out for the adapter over four years now. So it's got tried and tested. I've never seen anybody complain about it, never gotten calls about it. Nobody returns it. It's so much easier than having to unscrew, remove the mount, and change it. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that as well. Okay, so, you know, we've taken a, oh, and of course you have, you know, user customizable yeah, buttons, 789. Yeah, nine, nine total, three on one side, and then you've got, the, on the other side, you've got the standard six, and then you have the same area white radio here for lens control with the WC4, SXU, or Hi5. Okay, and um, let's talk price for a moment. So I went ahead and I, I kind of kitted this out yeah. myself and I ended up at like a hundred grand, maybe 78 ish. It's if you know, 77 for the production set. And then we are basically mostly in the U S side selling the, uh, a lot of customers want the high speed production media pack, which is three codex, two terabyte drives and the reader. And that's 13,000. So 77,900 plus 13, you're at about 91. 91, okay, but then I added some accessories and stuff I needed, so that got me to 100. <laughs> or, yeah, the production set has just the production set. If you wanted bits from the lightweight set, like, for example, you wanted the lightweight top handle or the lightweight base plate, then we offer an expansion set that's about, I think, just under 3,000 US, and that would give you every accessory. So you then could add that and say, I want to have both configurations, because we have a lightweight set that's 75, and then 77, 940 for the production set, and then that expansion's kind of all the bits in between, so it's kind of the delta. So, I mean, it's something that's probably going to be rental for uh, for most of us, but I mean, obviously your cameras have a reputation for lasting, I mean, a yeah, decade and beyond. Investment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we see a lot of owner, every every camera release that I've been here at Aerie, you know, from, you know, even the, the full-size LF less so, but the Mini LF especially, and even the original Mini, more and more owner operators. You know, here in the U.S. it's different than other markets, but we see a lot. You know, with the Mini LF, I would say at least half of the orders we booked as Aerie Inc. Direct were, were, you know, actually owner operators. And with this camera, it's actually probably even more than half direct is Aerie Inc. that are going to owner operators than rental houses um, with Alexa 35. And again, that doesn't mean that it's different with the dealers in different regions and whatnot. But I mean, I had so many people on launch day calling me that were cinematographers, DITs, um, even some directors, you know, that wanted to buy the camera's investment because they know how good the investment is. If they spend, you know, 90, even $100,000 now, they're going to make their ROI and they're going to be renting that camera for years to come. I mean, the original Mini is seven years old now. And if you still have, it's still renting, you know, you might not be getting the exact rental rate when you you first got it seven years ago, but to be fair, I don't think there's too many cameras that are seven years old that you can still really rent uh, from other people. A hundred percent in the digital age, and I mean, minis, so many things have been shot on minis, and honestly, right around August, I would say, would probably be an okay time to buy a used mini, maybe, you know, honestly, if I was looking at the market myself. Yep. So, Chase, why don't I leave you with kind of a, a philosophy question? This is a Super 35 camera. You, ah, yeah. I thought, okay, maybe large format, maybe that's what we're doing, maybe that's the future. 
future. I've yeah. loved Super 35 as a format my whole career. Mm -hmm. So Super 35 here to stay? It is definitely so. I mean, if you think back in the film camera days, it's going to go back quite a bit. We made Super 16 cameras, and we sold quite a lot of those right alongside our Super 35 cameras, and it was the right tool for the right job. The right project demanded maybe shallower depth of field, more depth of field, different ergonomics, lighter lenses, lenses with more range, faster lenses. It was based on what you were shooting. The 16mm and the Super 35 camera were for different applications, and so we see the same thing with Super 35. It's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. You have Super 35 now, and you have large format with the Mini LF and the full size LF and so they're great tools based on the kind of project you're doing and your creative choices and maybe even things like lensing for example. Yeah, so you're just looking at these as different yeah. options. You're just not saying the LF competes with the Super 35 yeah, in your mind as a product. The LF that we will sell at the same price alongside, you know, that it's always been. Uh, you know, we're not going to change that. It's it's offered there as the mini LF option that we've always had alongside the Alexa 35. Chase, thank you so much. I appreciate your time uh, with this little hands-on here with the new Area Alexa 35. Absolutely. You're very welcome. Cool. All right, guys. Stay tuned to CineD.com for more coverage from CineGear 2022. That's it for us from the Aerie booth. Hey, it's me again. Don't miss your chance to win one of 10 Fujifilm X-H2S cameras as well as $1,000 in cash. That's right. Visit CineD.com to learn more.